from a highly intensive to a less intensive. I hate the word regenerative, although it is basically just a mindset that we are together. Well, we're not going to go there today and talk about regenerative, but thinking about soil disturbance, how important is it, how important is it that we can do it? So we're thinking about a transition period from less is more, having been maxed out, let's say, and the impact of soil fibre. In and, in and around all of that, and why that, as far as Andrew is concerned, is also very important. Uh, and thinking about how soil carbon trends are affected by those types of, 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 of strategies and actions. So that's the aim. Um, first, first point of call really was to was to just go through and actually thank Stephen. Uh, Stephen Lamb from Bridgestone very much for spending a lot of time with the, the manufacturers setting the tractors up on the day. Um, Stephen basically took what was given to him as a, as a tractor and drill, checked out the axle loads, <coughs> thought about uh, ballasting, although there wasn't uh, a lot he could do about all of that at the time. Then optimised the, the, the tyre pressures in, 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 in essence for the field performance on that day, and, that, and that's what he did. And without spending a long time on it, you can see what Stephen called the original pressure, the arriving on the farm pressure. <coughs> These are quite high because they've been roaded there as a, as a, as a demo, uh, demo rig of, of, of green tractor. He managed to do a, um, a pretty good job of, of taking some of those pressures down in most cases. Um, there were things that were outside of his control, there were things that were outside of, of, the, uh, of the actual drill demonstrator's control at times, some of which were the type of tyre, you know, whether it was a, uh, a very flexible or a, a, a higher flex tyre that would therefore be capable of taking uh, lower pressure to operate a certain axle load, there were some that weren't, and often there was a correlation there, not in all cases, um, and of course, if it was a, a mounted drill, allowing for turning on headlands, extra load on the back axle, or the counterweight effect in field of the front honkers that were, 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 were counterbalancing the, the, the turning effect, there, there were some issues there that, that clearly were constraining what we could come down to. Um, and the other thing that really came out of this, and I, it'll show on the next uh, slide, was the narrower the drill, clearly, <coughs> the greater proportion of the field that was trafficked by that drill tractor. Goes without saying, doesn't it? But if we've got pressures and exerted that are going to constrain yield, and I'm thinking here, one bar, 14 half PSI, or, or, or within that parish, or down to 12, we would expect to see a reduction in yield as a result of that applied pressure, almost irrespective of drill, although a time-based drill with a little bit of loosening action possibly is going to get on a little bit better and able to cope with that than would a disc-based drill with no eradicate. <coughs> so clearly there are factors going on here. Narrow drills, high pressure, we're going to expect to see probably one or two hits on yield. So taking Steve's results, which is pulled apart and put back together again very effectively, I have to say, Steve, thank you for that. Um, I've really tried to look at the groups of drills here. Oops, sorry, I've gone way past the here. Let's take that back. Press the wrong button for the pointer there. Um, we've, we've got a bank of drills in the middle here, below Andrew's free flow, which the difference in yield, given it's a big plot unreplicated trial, I would have to suggest isn't necessarily hugely significant, all of those differences in yield, because we've got unreplicated trials here. I'm sure. The scientists might well, it's good to see Colin nodding or whether he's just gone like that as a result, I don't know. But yeah, so not a lot to choose from with that big block in the middle here, I would suggest. <coughs> if you look at, we're in terms of, of, of yield here, the predominance of time-based drills and the higher most yields, clearly there's a factor going on. We've learned a lot and understood a lot on the day about the conditions and clearly if we've got a drill with a mechanism to do something to help the tilth, to do a little bit of easing, to do a little bit of tilth manufacturing compared to an out-and-out, -out, very low disturbance disc-based drill, 
and clearly that might be positive in, in, in that respect. This is having been said, the time really wants to be lifting and loosening to an extent rather than what I would say is below its critical depth, in other words, pushing soil sideways and creating slots. So if you now then look at the types of drills that we used, the narrower the opener, the greater the risk or the greater the, the likelihood of, of, of pulling a slot starts to occur because <coughs> critical depth is related to, 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 to the actual time width. So there are factors there. Clearly a disc there is, is, is another animal. <coughs> the narrow drill trafficking effect I've already discussed and it, 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 it's, it's evidently quite clear here. The two very narrow drills have got issues more than the others. Not necessarily because of the drill type. If you'd have brought a wider one of those, that might be a bit different then. But we've got a, a, a very high proportion of the traffic area. And the benefits of disc-based drills, being able to cope with residues, being able to do very, very low levels of disturbance, can be particularly beneficial if you're trying to control grass weeds. Um, Steve talked about it earlier on. Some, a number of those benefits of disposed drills, clearly under the conditions we had, would be less apparent. Right? Let's put it that way. It is what it is. The conditions were what they were. A trail drill versus a mounted drill, clearly, doesn't matter which type, ideally, is going to give you greater opportunity to reduce tyre pressures on that drill tractor, provided we've got appropriate tyre gear, and that's something else that's, that's, that was relevant. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's a summary, if you like, of, of some of the factors around the drills and why they probably perform marginally differently on the day. Thinking about a move to less cultivation and, and to, dare I say, if you can, take the opportunity to do no cultivation, then take it for that season, those conditions. The general move to, to direct drilling, if I drag you out of your comfort zone, for those of you who don't do a lot, a lot of direct drilling, most of this I'm going to come up with now was done in the 80s. You know, we, we, we did a lot of direct drilling in the 70s and 80s. Uh, those of you that are as old as I am can just about remember most of what was going on then. Um, soil type is massively important here, and it was in those days, and they recognised it and they did a lot of work to assess the appropriateness of certain soil types for repeated continuous direct drilling for, for um, combine harvestable crops. <coughs> Their criteria for measurement was yield. It wasn't bottom line margin, it was yield in those days. Should it still be? It was in those days. Should it still be? Possibly too. The criterion was yield and they looked at different soil types and the ones here that have got a border with green <coughs> around it they would find, on average, across multiple <coughs> farms in the UK, on average, yield would be similar if, that, if those soils were direct drilled or they were conventionally cultivated, year on year. And we're looking at the chalky limestone, self-structuring, calcareous soils, well-drained loams, as being capable of giving us a similar yield, whether we do a lot with the cultivation or the <coughs> We then move into the groups of calcareous clays and non-calcareous but well-drained clays, which these would probably be very capable of giving you a, a similar yield in the autumn for an autumn sown crop, but might be more challenging in spring sown crops. Why is that? Well, part of, part of the reason behind this is when the soil gets to field capacity in the autumn and how quickly it is then to get back to field capacity in the spring after normal winters, which are probably well beyond field capacity through that period. <coughs> the time it takes to get back to field capacity might then limit the amount of time you've got to get your crop in optimally. Hence, it might be that these group of soils are quite capable of autumn sown, similar yield, but a little bit more challenging for spring sown. And then we get to the very challenging soils reading out what the spec is, sandy, silty and wet alluvial soil. So anything with a challenge